Okay, thanks a lot. So I hope my presentation will be uploaded now. Uh, let me see. It's always a moment of suspense whether the technology will work. Anyway, so, and I'd like to thank Ram, of course. Oh, yeah, wonderful. I'd like to uh, thank Ram for pulling all this together, actually. He has done that several times before, and we should be very grateful to him and for a wonderful setting of the stage. So I will talk uh, mostly about the problem and the limits to regional and global resilience, but later on also uh, to, I think, a golden opportunity of solving the problem. Barbara Videra from Poland will later address that too. So the limits to regional and global resilience, you know, the notion limits uh, has been discussed 50 years ago in a very prominent way. So I recently had a public debate with my old friend Dennis Meadows, who was the key author of the limits to growth in 1972. By the way, Joachim was one of the very few people who uh, recognized that the clip had in a Turkson shirt shared with us was the old protest song of Barry McGuire from 1965. Actually founded a heat band in 1964 and was singing that song, but it was relating to the Vietnam War in particular. And now it has been retexted uh, addressing the climate and the biodiversity crisis. Uh, very touching, actually, for me. So, you know, the limits of growth in 1972 changed in a way the public debate globally but it was, if you look here on the right-hand side, you see the collapse scenario. There are other scenarios. This is the collapse scenario. And it is mainly about depletion of resources, like oil and gas and so on. And you see the pollution thing is a tiny little hump, which is accompanying this the collapse curve and was not prominent. So talk to... to um, Various people in this context of the Club of Rome, I'm also a member of the Club of Rome, and they said they completely overlooked the climate and the biodiversity issue at that time. Huh? So it's a completely different world now. I will talk about planetary boundaries. This is a reference to a paper I co-authored. The key author was, or the lead author was, Johan Rockström, who is my successor at the Potsdam Institute now. And you see, there is a sort of safe operating space for humanity that's the inner green ball and the circle you see. But Kate Raber from Oxford University has come up with this so-called donut economics or bagel economics. That means, yes, we should not go outside the planetary boundaries, of course, uh, but we should not uh, mitigate at such a rate that we cannot deliver the social services we need. And this is precisely the debate we have now in Europe about gas from Putin, uh, gas from Russia. We cannot just cut down everything because otherwise people will suffer a lot. But we have to walk a very thin line and actually operate somehow in this green bagel or donut. Uh. That is a double challenge, actually. Uh. So. We are standing on the shoulders of giants, and I've shown this uh, four weeks ago, as um, uh, Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo will recall, because it was mentioned already that some of the giants here from the Pontifical Academy were Paul Crutzen and Mario Molina, who sadly died uh, one or two years ago, actually. Uh, and they have been instrumental in the whole debate. And, uh, the third in the bunch, the third in the club, was Sherry Rowland. You know, Mario and Paul uh, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry a while ago, together with the person you see here uh, sitting uh, from the left, the number four, Sherry Rowland. Uh, this was the gang, so to speak, the Ozone Layer gang, who unraveled and Susan Solomon, in a way, is part of this whole enterprise, uh, unraveled uh, the mystery of the ozone depletion of Antarctica. Uh, so this was a Nobel laureate's meeting in, in James Palace in 2009. And the person you see sitting next to Jerry Rowland from Africa, that is 
Wole Soyinka from Nigeria, who won the Nobel Prize in Literature, the first sub-Saharan African who ever won the Nobel Prize in Literature, and he had just published a very, very important book I recommend to everybody of you, Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People on Earth, which is irony, of course, it's from Nigeria. And you, we have seen, actually, destruction of uh, the Niger Delta in Nigeria in the clip Karin Lodzokin showed us. So you may not have recognized this is one of the most corrupt countries in the world where environmental destruction is widespread, actually. So I recommend this book to you. Coming back to Paul Crutzen, I wrote an obituary for him in PNAS, and Susan Solomon wrote an obituary <laughs> in science. So, uh, and where I was actually referring to both of them, Paul Crutzen and Mario Molina. And you know, uh, Ram has already used this uh, sentence, avoiding the unmanageable and managing the unavoidable. A uh, phrase I coined uh, at a meeting with the Belgian Academy of Science a long time ago. So these are the two sides of the strategy we need. Uh, so we did a, a book uh, in 2004, Avoiding Dangerous Climate Change, Avoiding the Unmanageable. And then we had a report for the United Nations, sponsored by Sigma Xi, Managing the Unavoidable, that came out in 2007. Uh, and actually, at that time, I thought it's mostly about avoiding the unmanageable, of which I will talk a little bit. Uh, what are the big accidents we need to avoid by all means, almost all means on Earth? Uh, but unfortunately, it's absolutely right what Ram said. The 1.5 degrees uh, limit will be transgressed. Uh, if not in 10 years, when in 20 years from now. Actually, next year, we expect another El Nino event, and I guess we will be very close already to the 1.5 degrees. Huh? So we will have to settle if all things go right, not wrong, if all things go right. We will have to accommodate our societies to something like two degrees warming, which already will trigger a lot of tipping points in the Earth system. So we refer to the 2015 Paris Agreement. You know, um, I'm very happy to learn that the Vatican finally is ratifying the Paris Agreement with a very strong statement. It took a lot of time, but uh, it's wonderful that this happened now. And you know, I, I introduced this idea of tipping elements in the Earth system. It was a paper. Uh, published in 2008, actually, about the vital organs of this planet. So Joachim and Ram and Susan have seen this many times. But this is about why irreversible change could be triggered if we transgress 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, 3 degrees, so on. It's like the human body. And I'll give you just a few examples, the Greenland ice sheet. If you look to the upper right corner, Greenland ice sheet lost a record 1 million tons of ice in 2019 per minute. So this is the biggest anthropogenic flow on Earth. I mean, it's almost unbelievable, the sheer mass of dynamics. And of course, we are about to close down the Gulf Stream system. It's already the weakest in the last 1,000 years. My personal intuition that it will be shut down in the second half of his century, uh, the Amazon rainforest, uh, Ram was already referring to that. If we lose more of the, the sort of canopy cover when it will be turned into a savanna or even steppe. And if you worry or if you wonder why we have so many heat waves now in Europe, in particular in Europe, just came out a, a paper, but we published this in 2013, has to do with the modification of the jet stream, which is organizing the weather system on the, in the northern hemisphere. There's a weaker jet stream also in the southern hemisphere. Sometimes it splits up in, into branches, and they create something like a waveguide. It's a complicated physics. But you see here what happened in 2018. We had this very wavy jet stream where you have double branches and so on. And 
this heat wave over Europe, you can see it with uh, forests burning even in Scandinavia, but it's due to this change circulation pattern. Huh? So it's really the dynamics of the atmosphere, not the statistic, that is changing our world. And this year, very year, we have the third heat wave is, is due to jet stream behavior here. By the way, 2018 was the year when a little girl was sitting on the steps of the parliament in Stockholm, named Greta Thunberg, because the forests were burning in Sweden, something unheard of. So this is our sort of summary of what can go wrong. Uh, we published this in Nature Climate Change 2016. What you see in this complicated graphics, the wavy curve is the global mean temperature over the last 20,000 years. You know, we emerged from the Ice Age when we had this extremely stable climate in the so-called Holocene where human civilization was created. On the right-hand side, you see the various scenarios, what could go right. The green line on the right-hand side, this is already gone more or less. We will not stop global warming below 1.5 degree. We are somewhere on the orange or the red line. And if you then go to the right, this would mean by the year 2500, it could be four, six, eight degrees warming. And you see the Paris range, and you see all the arrow bars for the various tipping elements, the Western Arctic ice sheet, Greenland ice sheet. Actually, I will refer to it as a new, as a new uh, update, uh, which will be published in Science soon, which will take up this. We will have cascades of tipping elements. I will not refer to that now. As this updated assessment for uh, bigger than 1.5 degrees warming, and you see, you recognize, I guess, this error bar um, figure. The sad thing is, and Susan and others know it, the red color is coming down all the time. The more research we do, the nearer sort of the threshold come. It's natural because we have not looked at many processes and feedback loops. Huh? So 1.5 degrees would be wonderful if we could stop where, but we won't. We are just publishing a paper in PNS called Climate Endgame, a research agenda for exploring catastrophic climate change scenarios. And actually, if I would have talked here or somewhere else about catastrophic climate change, I would have been dubbed an alarmist or a scaremonger or whatever. Today, unfortunately, we have gone so far, we have lost three decades, but we are entering possibilities. We will do this paper. It will be published. It will set up a research agenda. And it could talk about societal collapse, uh, unfurling feedbacks, mortality and morbidity, and integrated climate catastrophic or catastrophe, catastrophe assessment, which probably should be in the next IPCC report. The IPCC didn't, did not dare to touch it yet. Huh? So here we go, that is uh, 1.2 degrees warming. We are currently in a La Nina year, as you know, so we should have a bit more cooling. I expect El Nino next year, so we will close, be very close to 1.5 degrees already. Yeah. Now let me show you the following. If people do not believe that we have already changed the world in the Anthropocene, this is a paper we published in Nature in 2016. It shows you how the interplay of CO2 in the atmosphere and solar insulation, which is just an astrophysical thing, is creating the ice ages. And you can now count 800,000 years ago how many ice ages we had. It always had to do with the crossing of this line. And now we tell you what will happen in the future. So the next ice ages are due in 50,000 years from now and 100,000 years from now, according to this very succinct analysis. The problem is it won't happen anymore. So if you look at the black line that has to do with the insulation uh, and the, the uh, carbon we have put into the atmosphere, you see, if we would have no carbon, that's the blue line, it will intersect this black line. That would mean that would be the next ice age, 50,000 years from now, the next 100,000 years. 
but we have already put 500 gigatons of carbon, carbon, not CO2, into the atmosphere. You see the yellow line, uh, the orange line is just touching the black line. But since we keep emitting, there will be no crossing point anymore. It will not intersect, actually. So the next ice age is off. I mean, this should be something everybody would be wondering about, at least. You know, some people say, of course, who needs an ice age? But the ice age is creating fertile soils, for example. Huh? But this is a tremendous input into the current planetary system already. So uh, it all could have been avoided. Uh, the Americans among us, in particular, know that Frank Press died, uh, who was the chief advisor to uh, President Jimmy Carter, president of the National Academy of Sciences. And actually, he wrote in 1977 this memo to the president. Now it can be retrieved. You can find it everywhere. Uh, it stated on just one page what the warming would be in the year 2022, how high the concentration of CO2 would be, what would be the reverberations of that. And there is a stamp on it seen by the president, Jimmy Carter, but the rest of the cabinet warned against taking this too seriously yeah? and said, this is the unclear, the science is unclear, we shouldn't do it. This memo could have changed the world. It didn't. So we have now the IPCC talking about impacts, adaptation, vulnerability. I just show you what will happen because we talk about adaptation. And uh, please consider this. This is the coastline of Europe. Then all the ice will melt, including East Antarctic ice sheet, but would take millennia, of course. This would be the coastline of the United States. Florida would be gone. And actually, every major capital of Southeast Asia would be gone. And this is maybe even more scary because this is about the limits to uh, human capacity to stand the combination of extreme heat and humidity. Yeah? It's about the so-called wet bulb temperature. And if you look at the dark red areas, these are the areas where, if business as usual is continued, where you could not live outside an air-conditioned house all year long, actually. These are the regions which would become uninhabitable in the true sense of the word. So if you put this all together, what is the human niche? There's a new paper coming out very, very soon about this. Um, it simply means that the habitable zone of about 3 billion people is at stake. 3 billion people could we relocate in peace without bloodshed, without economic collapse? 3 billion people on this planet, that's absolutely impossible. Huh? That's why I talk about the limits to adaptation. Uh, I mean, this is not a minor challenge. <laughs> In Germany, our political system almost collapsed in 2015 because we took in a million refugees from Syria, from Ethiopia, and so on. Now we try to accommodate two million people from Ukraine, in Poland, in Germany, and so on. But could you accommodate billions of people? It's absolutely impossible in that view. So, Kira Finke, who unfortunately cannot join us because of the COVID thing, will talk about an idea we had about the so-called Nansen passport for climate change. You know, Rudyard Nansen, the godfather of all the research, received the Nobel Peace Prize in the 1920s because he came up with a passport for people who had lost their nationality. It was after the First World War when people from Russia were simply expelled, had no passport anymore. And in the end, about 50 countries accepted the Nansen passport. I think we would need something like that. That is adaptation to climate change. If people who have lost their island, Vanuatu, Tuvalu, whatever, would have access to the countries who destroyed their territory. So in particular, to the United States, to UK, to Germany, and so on. That would be equitable, actually. It would only be fair. 
but race with at the United Nations. I mean, you can imagine what the reaction will be. But Radio Nansen did that at the time. So finally, I tell you a, a, a little story. I, I had a conference uh, at the University of East Anglia in Norwich many, many years ago. And uh, when I got to the airfield, I ran into somebody from the World Bank. And he said, John, uh, we have $40,000 left to burn this fiscal year. Can you do a study on climate adaptation to four degrees warming? So a little bit of agriculture and so on. I said, yes, we can look at it if you can spend the money. Uh, so I put together a group of people impromptu uh, at the Potsdam Institute. And we did our study. And actually, this is the result. Turn down the heat. Why a four degrees warmer world must be avoided. The result was not, oh, number of recipes for adapting to global warming. We simply said there is no adaptation. This is, in a way, the most successful series the World Bank ever did. So Jim Kim, who was when the president supported it, it I think changed the attitude towards climate change of the World Bank. And we came up with regional adaptation. Uh, and resilience, uh, that is, the bottom line is there is no adaptation to four degrees warming, and there is no adaptation to three degrees warming, whether we can adapt at all to two degrees warming. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, actually. But if we do, it has to be based on natural solution, in my view. So we need desperately integrated solutions, combining mitigation and adaptation. And actually, the transformation of the built and the planted environment is, in my view, the golden opportunity. So we had a conference in this very room recently. And Joachim Pompaun generously supported it, and Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo and Cardinal Turkson here. And this is actually the picture we took here on the steps of the academy, so Ursula von der Leyen was the keynote speaker. We had world-class um, <coughs> architects like Francis Carré from Burkina Faso, who you can see next to the lady on the right, which is uh, the German Federal Minister for Construction. Uh, and this was about the elephant in the climate room, uh, the built environment, which is creating 40% of the global emissions, completely overlooked in my view. We talk about air traffic and so on, 2% of the global emissions, for example. But actually, if we rebuild the world in the right way, if we use, for example, timber and bamboo instead of uh, steel and concrete, and we use the design principles that were created in the past in Iran, in Sahel zone uh, in, in the Amazon region and so on. Uh, and we learn from nature how to adapt to a different climate. I think we can still save the world. Thank you very much.